This is the aerodynamics of the Audi TT 2020. It's the RS version, which stands for something. Over the last few decades, the TT has been incredibly successful, and its styling has become more and more aggressive, which looks better. But Audi announced that this 2020 version will be the last. So how aerodynamic is it? Let's find out. We have the regular TT RS version, and we also tested it with the driver's side window broken in, perhaps because you parked in a bad neighborhood. For the regular version, the front looks pretty good. It also suffers from a similar problem as the R8 though, where it is just too blocky. But because the TT costs a fifth of the R8, it is a little more acceptable. And the reason why this blocky front is bad is because you can see just how high the pressure is here. So the air is hitting the front, dumping all its kinetic energy into the car and trying to push it backwards. That's bad for drag. The front lip is pretty good, not great, because we can see that the flow stays attached over most of it, but there is still some flow separation. A way to mitigate that would be to round the underneath a little, so there isn't just the sharp edge for the flow to hit and separate. The flow also accelerates a little, which is largely because the TT is quite close to the ground. That acceleration comes with a lower pressure, so that is good for downforce. For the rest of the underbody, the flow is very nicely behaved, it remains fast and attached. Looking at the pressure here, it's good in that it remains low too, so that helps produce some downforce. But cleverly, there is more low pressure around the front wheels. That isn't by accident because the TT historically had a problem with stability at high speeds. That is because this car's general shape naturally produces lift, it's like a wing almost. To overcome this problem, the aerodynamicist slapped a rear wing on it, which helped a lot. But that only produces downforce at the rear wheels. As a result, the car would be still unstable, because around corners now, the front wheels don't have any downforce. So to correct to that, there is now a lot of low pressure around the front wheels, which helps balance out the downforce from the rear wing. That is clever designing. Moving to the hood, I am very impressed with it because it is really not that sleek. It is very flat, and that usually comes with a bunch of problems, including flow separation, and where the flow meets the windshield, we can usually see recirculation. Here, it's not that much though. To begin with, the flow stays attached over the front edge, and that is because the edge is very rounded. So the flow can just follow it nicely. Then when it meets the windshield, there is some flow separation, but not very much, especially given just how upright the front windshield is compared to the hood. What's more, you can see that the flow doesn't change velocity too much. That is very surprising for a couple reasons. The first is that because the windshield is so upright, usually the flow will slam into it and decelerate, but it doesn't do that much here. How did Audi achieve this? It is actually achieved by the very front of the hood. It's very good here. That high curvature initially pushes so much of the flow upwards. You can see how much of an upwards direction it has here. Then the hood has a gentle slope upwards, which preserves the flow's general upwards trend. So by the time it hits the windshield, it actually isn't parallel to the ground yet, but at an angle, which reduces the angle the windshield sees. If the front of the hood was flatter, this wouldn't happen. So this is a great example of how an upstream feature dramatically affects downstream aerodynamics. Looking at the pressure in this region, it is much better than what it could be, but it isn't perfect still, and that is because despite the clever error at the front, the windshield is still very upright, and so we get high pressure at the base, you could argue that this helps increase the downforce, but it comes at the expense of high drag. And actually, there's a far better way to produce downforce without the drag penalty, and that is by changing the car's roof. It is just too sharp at the front, and we see the consequences here were, okay, sure the flow stays attached, which is nice, but look at just how red the flow is. It has accelerated to over 30% faster than the free stream flow. That naturally leads to a much lower pressure, and we see that the pressure here is the lowest out of anywhere in the flow and by a long way. That roof styling was the main reason for the TT's long time instability problem because it produces so much lift and is over such a large surface area which exacerbates the problem. It is also a problem that the R8 inherited. To solve this problem, Audi tried to use other aero devices like the rear wing, but for this particular case, that is really just trying to put a band-aid over a crack in the wall. A far better aerodynamic approach would be to change the car's styling altogether make the windshield sleeker so that the angle between it and the roof becomes much flatter. That way, the flow doesn't have to turn as much. That reduces the acceleration and the subsequent lower pressure here. And as an added bonus, you can drop the drag because you wouldn't need aero devices to begin with, which also increases the drag naturally, and the high pressure at the base of the windshield would also reduce. There is also another problem with the sharp junction between the windshield and the roof, and that is because it accelerates the flow so much, Later over the back window, the flow has to decelerate. So these two large changes result in the flow, particularly close to the surface, to have lower energy. That's because viscosity has removed some energy. 
What that means for the rear wing is that, as we can see, the flow hitting it is slower, the boundary layer is thicker. As such, the wing can't work as effectively, which reduces the downforce it creates. So not only is that peak on the roof increasing lift, but it is also reducing how much downforce is produced elsewhere. If you want to make the rear wing produce more downforce, you need to put it higher so that it sees faster flow. And looking at the pressure, moving the wing higher would also benefit the TT because, as we can see, yes, it does produce pretty decent low pressure underneath, but look where that low pressure is occurring. It's right over the trunk. So that cancels out some of the downforce from the rear wing because the low pressure over the trunk is also pulling the car up, i.e. lift. So while the TT does look good, its aero is a little botched. The diffuser is okay, not great. It is quite subtle and the resulting effects show that the flow isn't kicked up that much. So if they went for a more aggressive diffuser, they could increase the downforce even further. But they may have decided on such a low key diffuser because they didn't want to throw off the balance of the car. From on top, the flow is significantly better at the front windshield junction, the recirculation zone only occurs for the very middle section, and that's because as you head towards the sides, the flow can escape around the A-pillars more. However, that doesn't alleviate the pressure that much, because so much flow redirection comes at a price. The mirrors aren't that great, we can see large wakes behind them, and that also leads to a lot of drag, as shown by these large red regions. Interestingly, for this car, the aerodynamicist decided to keep the mirror wakes fairly close to the car, which makes the car dirtier over time because the dirt in the air is deposited onto the car instead of being thrown away. Around the sides of the car, the flow is very well behaved. That also results in good flow around the rear, which reduces the wake size. And as we can see in this drag orbit, where around the rear wing, there is almost no drag. Most of the drag from the wake occurs much lower down on the car. Looking at the vortices, the front wheels are fiends with bottom and top vortices forming. That results in high drag around this area too. The A-pillars and low pillars are really good for this car. They don't produce significant vortices, which results in no drag from these regions either. The rear wheels are a little better because they only have vortices from the lower half of the wheels, which is likely because there isn't as much high energy flow being pushed into the rear wheel houses, which then needs to escape later. As such, the drag from the rear wheels is mostly from the lower half. In terms of the rear wing, Audi did a great job incorporating winglets into a good looking design. The tips drooping down are highly effective because we don't see any wingtip vortices and as such, the drag of the wing is reduced. The TT's drag coefficient is 0.32, which is quite high for a modern car, but a lot better than a supercar. Overall, it produces 5.6 kilos of lift, which is about the size of a large sandwich. How is the TT's aerodynamics affected when the driver's side window is broken? Let's find out now. Comparing the general streamlines without the window, the TT seems to have very similar aerodynamics, except for two regions. The white streamlines show that over time, air is sucked out of the window, but surprisingly, they don't alter the flow too much, they just hug the side of the roof and merge into the wake. But looking from on top, we see the streamlines are definitely skewed now. For the undamaged TT, the streamlines are very straight and symmetrical about the centre, but for the damaged TT, they are definitely tilted towards the driver's side. Does that affect the aerodynamics of the car? The front of the car is very similar. Both the velocities and the pressures are the same. So the missing window doesn't affect upstream very much. That's good. And the front of the roof is also pretty similar. The flow accelerates about the same, but once it gets past the roof, then the aerodynamics changes quite a lot. The flow is much slower near the car when the window is gone. And given what we saw with the streamlines, where those white ones whipped out of the window and over the back, this makes a lot of sense. That's because the flow in the car is very slow. We can see here that it's like one meter per second or so, which is great for comfort, but that means that when the flow comes out of the car, it's one meter per second too. And when it hits the free stream flow, it is being accelerated by it, but it doesn't get up to speed. So the rear window is seeing much slower flow now. That then results in the rear wing seeing even slower flow and potentially reducing its downforce. How does this all translate in the pressure? The rear window isn't affected that much. Perhaps the really low pressure region over the roof is truncated a little, but we can see much higher pressure under the wing. So the slower flow hitting it reduces its downforce. And that is because of how the flow out the window is directed. If it could be directed more to one side, that would create some torque on the car, but it would also improve the rear wing's performance. From on top, we see a lot of unsteadiness coming out of the window. And this actually answers a lot of people's questions about why there is buffeting when one window is open and the other window is up. We see here that the flow goes in then there is too much flow inside, so some pops out, and then there is some room now for more flow to cram in, 
and so some goes in and so on we go. That unsteady phenomenon is clearly affecting the wake, but fortunately, it's not around much of the car, so some of the potential problems, like inducing vortices elsewhere, doesn't occur. And looking at the vortices, we do see huge ones coming out of the window, and this rear view shows just how much the flow skews to one side. That results in the flow around the left side of the car to separate earlier around the rear, while the flow around the right side of the car stays attached around the rear more. And looking at the drag, much of the car's drag is still the same, but we obviously get so much more out of that gaping hole, and it is unsteady. A way to reduce that unsteadiness is to break the under window and give the flow another path to exit from. With the driver's side window gone, the drag coefficient jumps up 20 counts to 0.34, and interestingly, lift actually drops to 3.0 kilos. That could be because of the roof, because even though there was such a minor change, because the roof is so large, that could easily add up to 2.6 kilos or less. Roll of the story, breaking your TT's window will increase your drag, but it will also reduce your downfalls. Peace out amigos.